Hello and welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with uh, Sean Jones. Uh, you guys all know Sean Jones. We've had her on the show before. Uh, you've also perhaps listened to her last uh, regulation episode from the Amsterdam conference we just put out uh, two days ago. And um, today we're going to talk about regulation pretty much and the whole episode. There's a lot of things that have been going on. So uh, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to catch up with kind of what the situation is in terms of regulation and how Bitcoin businesses are regulated, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, hey, Sean. Hi there, guys. Lovely to be back on the show. Hi. Thanks for coming on again. Uh, and by the way, thank you very much for these uh, uh, regulation interviews that you did in Amsterdam. They're really great. And so we're publishing, we published the first one this week and the next one's coming out next week. And so I think they're very insightful and it's very timely uh, uh, with regards to what just came out uh, and what we'll be talking about today. Well, I, I agree completely. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful to those who spent the time to be interviewed. Um, in this uh, first of the series of two, we had Brian Scalatos, who's a partner at uh, uh, a tax uh, law firm in uh, the USA. And he was talking about um, the IRS, the US IRS position on uh, on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies. Uh, we had Esteban Van Gogh, who's a tax lawyer at uh, PwC in the Netherlands, who uh, specializes in uh, VAT or European sales tax. Uh, Jerry Brito, who's uh, probably the leading uh, academic. He's an adjunct professor and research fellow uh, at George Mason University. He is a very interesting guy. He was involved in the um, Senate hearings in the US. He's written uh, two excellent papers on uh, regulation of uh, Bitcoin. And we had a, a very different kind of interviewee, uh, Luis uh, Quende, who um, um, is a hacker. He won uh, an award for hacking in Europe at the age of uh, 15. He became an advisor to the vice president of the European Commission. So he has a, a lot of insight. And uh, together they made a, 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 a wonderful bunch of uh, interviewees. And I'm very grateful to them all for sparing some time at the, uh, at the uh, Bitcoin 2014. Yeah. I, I I was kind of, uh, we were both kind of surprised that this 18 year old kid is an advisor to the European Commission. I mean, that's, that's really impressive. Not just to the Commission, but actually to uh, the Vice President of the Commission, um, Neely Cruz. Um, you know, the Commission is made up of, a, of um, uh, multiple commissioners from different uh, member states. And Neely Cruz is uh, the Dutch. Um, commissioner and also vice president of the commission uh, now that might all be shaken up after the recent elections uh, but, but but at the moment that's been the case and she had the uh, remit for the digital agenda so um she's uh, she's no she's no uh, no disrespect her she's no young person at all and yet she's very very much um into um innovation and the digital economy and uh, she reached out to um luis and um he he's one of her advisors absolutely brilliant fantastic chat to listen to yeah, it was especially thought it was interesting that he mentioned. Uh, apparently, he raised uh, like a pretty significant round of, run, uh, round of funding, especially for Europe, and is starting a Bitcoin exchange in Switzerland. So I I'd never heard about before. So that was very interesting. So I'm, I'm curious to see what comes out of that. I guess uh, I. I teased him. I teased him about moving to Switzerland because, of course, Switzerland sits outside the European Union. So he's moving from Spain, which is within, to somewhere outside. Even though he advises the, <laughs> the European yeah, that's Commission. a bit ironic. Yeah. <laughs> well, we also just got back from Coin Summit, so we were in London uh, until. I mean, I got back yesterday. I think Seb got back Friday, and uh, you know, we spent two days uh, Thursday, Friday at the conference, which was in Canary Wharf. Uh, this was a uh, conference organized by Premier Galenbe. He's also been on the show sort of at least for a short interview. So I did the short one and, and Seb, you, you talked about the conference with him before. 
So yeah, it was a it was a great event. Lots of great speakers. Um, we did some really great interviews too. I think that will be coming out. Um, I guess in like two weeks, starting two weeks, maybe after we've done uh, Sean's second regulation episode. Yeah, it was a great conference, and just hats off to Pamir and his wife uh, Gilnar for for putting on such a great event. Um, uh, I came away from that event pretty, you know, very energized. Uh, as always, <laughs> when I come back from a Bitcoin event, it's great to meet everybody there, and uh, and uh, always a good time. So, great conference yeah. with like really, I, I thought you know, quality panels. Um, I thought the panels were of pretty good quality and high, you know, high level quality. Uh, maybe not, not every. I was maybe interested by every one of them, but uh, some really. In important topics were discussed. I, I thought what was kind of interesting was that, you know, if, if you know, Canary Wharf is like the Wall Street of London. So there are all those huge uh, banking headquarters. It's sort of a very sterile area. You know, nobody lives there, basically. Uh, and it was really in the middle of it in this glass domed space. So you could see outside, and, you know, you'd see the uh, Citibank headquarters, you know, the investment bank at least, HSBC, all these uh, big investment banks. JP Morgan also. Yeah, yeah. And so we yeah. were like sitting in the middle kind of doing this Bitcoin conference. What I thought was kind of interesting was that there were basically no bankers there. You know, we talked with Premier about that at the end, but it seems like they haven't, um, uh, you know, they haven't gotten to the point where they feel this is something interesting or interesting enough to spend, you know, maybe take two days off and um, get involved there. Don't be, um, don't be hoodwinked into thinking that the banks aren't extremely interested in what cryptocurrencies have to uh, uh, have to offer them. I would um, I would say that they are certainly keeping their uh, heads uh, below the parapet. They don't want to be seen to be doing it. And um, uh, there are a number of large banks who uh, who have projects already underway now. Um, looking at how they can use um, blockchain technology. I think that's probably the best way, either in a proprietary or a non-proprietary way. And, uh, of course, some of these projects will come about. Some of them won't come about. Uh, but they're, they're, they're quite keen. They don't want to be seen to be keen. But, of course, the new EBA um, opinion may may change a lot of that. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about that. Yeah, I mean, now. I'm sure, th I, I mean, we know that there's a lot of things going on in finance and banking and, you know, that there's starting to be uh, interest. But uh, just purely, if you looked at the crowd, uh, that wasn't apparent yet. Um, and I, I mean, I think Parmi also mentioned, you know, he didn't do any marketing specific to the kind of um, banking sector, to the financial sector. So that may have been a reason for it. Uh, and, and I presume this will change, you know, I presume in a year from now, you will see a significant number of, of uh, just, uh, you know, no regular, quote unquote, regular bankers. But uh, I guess let's get started with um, the EBA. Sean, uh, do you want to give us uh, a brief sort of um, summary of what this has been about? Absolutely. Well, a brief, that's an interesting word because this or, or um, very long. official document. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, my summary will be brief. But the thing that was published uh, Friday week ago on July 4th, um, some people might read something into the fact that um, it was American Independence Day. And of course, all of America was asleep um, in terms of the financial world. They were not plugged in that, that day. And it was followed by the weekend. So perhaps, um, you know, it hasn't had quite the impact that it should have done or may have done on another day. They published a 46-page, yes, 46-page opinion um, uh, on the regulation of virtual currencies um, in the European Union. So this is a, a document that's been published by a super regulator, the European Banking Authority, and I'll, I'll talk a little about them later on. Um, these are the folks who, you may recall, back in December last year, published a, a warning uh, on the risks of virtual currencies. This was a warning to consumers. And that warning then triggered a raft of similar warnings from banking and financial regulators around the world. That They're still coming out now. So I think there have probably been about 50 of them so far, I think. And they've all pretty much um, been uh, echoing the, 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 what the EBA uh, published back in December last year. So the EBA is um, is is 
important not only within Europe, but is followed uh, globally. And they uh, carried out a, a joint assessment with other European um, regulatory authorities, super authorities, and identified all the risks associated. Um, they listed some 70 risks, and they then uh, proceeded to come up with their proposal for how to deal with those risks. Um, they see a two-pronged approach. Um, in the long term, they see a whole new body of uh, European Union regulation to govern uh, virtual currencies, and they recognize um, that it, it may take considerable time. They even say it may never happen. Um, but in the meantime, they call for immediate action by national regulators in the individual EU member states. Uh, they use an interesting word here to discourage banks, payment institutions, and e-money institutions from buying, holding, or selling virtual currencies. So um, this is coded language for uh, essentially calling on the national regulators to take immediate action to ban credit institutions, payment institutions, e-money institutions from direct involvement in virtual currencies. And um, they also recommended that um, virtual currency gateways, so um, exchanges most typically, should be made subject to anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing regimes. And um, that's probably about the least, um, uh, you know, least contentious of the proposals because I think most people have accepted that that was bound to happen. It's already happened in some jurisdictions. And um, essentially what they're saying is at the friction points between fiat and uh, virtual currencies, um, AML systems, KYC, customer due diligence, the, the raft of things that normally apply will uh, need to um, uh, will, will will need to be put into effect, and and, and uh, they're they're calling for that to be done. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's their two tier approach. Yeah. So I think it's interesting if you read it. Uh, Right, they talk about this like short term thing and the long term thing, and the short term thing is like, well, oh, that's you know not too bad, and then the long term uh, ideas they have are just completely uh, crazy. I mean, they, they are literally impossible uh, to uh, comply with. Uh, they are uh, they're completely absurd. Uh, but perhaps before we go into the, um, I don't know, where should we start? Should we start with the long term thing? Well, the, the, the long-term thing, yes, is a good place to start, but possibly um, there's a kind of uh, – I, I think we need to understand the viewpoint, if you like, where the EBA is coming from. You know, we need to understand who is this thing called the EBA because most people have never heard of it. It's another European uh, quango, another um, – yet another authority. Okay, let's talk about EBA first. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, the, the EBA, let's see that about its background. The EBA was created um, after – the national banking supervisors in each of the EU member states and the Europe-wide committee, advisory committee made up of all those um, national supervisors failed to see the financial crisis coming. And um, quite understandably, you know, they said that, that, you know, you've got all these these very clever financial folks and they didn't see what was about to come. Uh, they missed something that threatened the whole financial system. Uh, we need to put well, it's the usual European solution, isn't it? We need to create another body, uh, another supervisory body, in there. and they, they, they come up with a whole new system of supervision um, made up out of the uh, insurance industry, uh, which has its new super regulator, the Security and Markets uh, Authority covering securities and markets, and the European Banking Authority, and it opened its doors for business uh, at the beginning of 2011, and uh, was put in charge of all the national regulators. Um, so each country sets its own laws that are generally that generally have to be harmonised to European um, legislation. And uh, this was to make sure that the individual national regulators would 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 um, 
you know, all comply with those rules. And it, it essentially it's an independent authority. Uh, and uh, well, I'm quoting from its website here, it says, which works to ensure effective and consistent prudential regulation and supervision across the European banking sector. And it has objectives to do with financial stability in the EU and safeguarding integrity and um, efficiency and the orderly functioning uh, of the banking sector. So essentially, they will tell uh, the national regulators what to do. So what they uh, think or decide in terms of Bitcoin is going to be implemented by the national governments. Is that correct? Um, partly. It does have um, wide-ranging powers, and in emergency situations can uh, can impose things directly on individual countries in Europe. But mainly it, it functions by uh, issuing different kinds of, um, um, of, of documentation. So in, 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 um, in a harmonized banking sector, um, it, it, it produces various technical standards. These things are binding. Um, but it also has recommendations and guidelines and something called opinions, which are not binding. And these opinions are generally addressed at particular parts of the European legislative um, uh, infrastructure. So in this case, this opinion, the opinion on virtual currencies, has been directed to the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the Council of Ministers, the three entities that basically make European law. And that European law then flows down to the individual countries, which then have to harmonize to those laws. And the regulators in each of those countries have to enforce those regulations. This opinion, is it binding or is it simply you know, an opinion which uh, national banks are being advised to follow? Like, I mean, an opinion by definition cannot be binding, no? Exactly. This is non-binding. Um, it doesn't bind anyone to anything. So the long-term objectives it um, addresses to the legislators and it's saying you know this is we've looked at this thing called virtual currencies go make some legislation we think this is how you should do it uh, whether or not that actually happens is yet something that will take probably anything between two and four years i would imagine typically in europe um, it also makes some recommendations to the individual national regulators because national regulators can go over and above um, the European regulations. They've got to meet and harmonize to the European regulations, but you know, national regulations can be more stringent. And so they're making recommendations to, as I mentioned earlier on, discourage banks and payments and e-money institutions from buying, holding, or selling virtual currencies. So that's a recommendation to the individual national supervisors to do something specific in the short term. They could ignore those recommendations or they could follow them, make them a little bit stronger, a little bit weaker. Uh, they've given them room, wriggle room, as we would say in, in the UK, uh, to um, work around this word of discourage. So that's coded language for ban, but a country might not necessarily ban. Well, let's talk about what those actually are. So maybe I will give you, so I'll give maybe a very short sort of like how I interpret it, then maybe you can, uh, you can, Sean, you can uh, say if that's totally off or what you think. So my, my impression kind of is that they have their existing regulations, their existing safeguards, control over the financial system. There's this new thing called a virtual currency, how they call it, or cryptocurrency. Um, and now they're basically saying, oh, this doesn't fit in our system. Like, this works differently, anonymous, anybody can create it, people can get hacked. Like, what if uh, it's fraud? Like, what if you send it and then you didn't want to send it, the wrong address? What if, uh, what if it's issued by a criminal? What if it goes to a terrorist? Like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's so they list all these risks. And it's like, well, obviously, uh, you know, we have to make sure that all this, all these things that, you know, that, that can't happen and that our existing safeguards that we have with the existing financial system, like sort of we have that same level of control. And then they 
they I think they go from there and they issue like, oh, of course, then, uh, you know, anonymity is a problem. Of course, then it's a problem that anyone can create a uh, uh, cryptocurrency. Of course, this is a problem. And then they come up with all these lists of measurements of like how you can basically or you could force a virtual currencies to sort of behave like the existing financial system because of then, then of course, they have the same level of control. Now, that completely does not fit at all with uh, cryptocurrencies and kind of like blatantly disregards their nature. Now, that's kind of my impression. I, I, I would suspect they're probably totally aware that this is impossible, but they just go ahead anyway. And then in the future, they'll, uh, you know, be sort of be a situation where, well, we have all these, although of course it's very premature since this is not actually uh, legal in any way. But I could see this scenario like that, that they say, oh, we have all these rules now. You know, if cryptocurrencies don't comply with those rules, well, you know, it's their problem. We made specifically some nice rules so you could actually fit in. Um, and so it'd be sort of a, also a um, basis on which to enforce things against uh, cryptocurrency businesses. Well, what do you think, Sean? Well, I think you've summarized it very well. You don't really need me on the show at all. <laughs> um, you, you've said it exactly. Um, the, the, they've said, here is the banking system. We've, we, we, we've been set up to harmonize and level out this uh, playing field that makes up um, the, the traditional financial services sector, particularly the payment banking and payment services. And there's this new thing that's come along, as you say, but virtual currency. So it, 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 it includes cryptocurrencies, but it could include other uh, privately issued um, uh, currencies as well. And, well, they, they're, they're different, but they perform some of the same functions. So let's have a look at, uh, let's, let's dissect them and have a look at them. And hence, they sort of picked out this list of 70 uh, risks associated. Now, many of these risks, of course, are associated with the traditional world as it is now, the, the regulated financial services sector. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the EBA is is negative about them it's just saying you know you want to understand them we've looked into them and these are the risks and well yes you're right they don't quite fit so how do we solve that problem will we make them fit and we make them fit by saying that um uh, uh, virtual currencies need to um be as closely oh, as closely as possible, make themselves regulatable. Um, let's put it that way. Um, someone needs to be accountable. So, if you deal with, say, an individual entity like, uh, let's say, PayPal, for example, uh, uh, an entity that was set up um, years ago to meet some of the same objectives that that some virtual currencies do now in terms of reducing costs, for example. That didn't actually happen because it became part of the system. And um, there's some parallels you might want to draw there. Um, you know, there is an entity called PayPal. It has to register itself within the European Union in so at some level. It has to uh, be authorized. It has to meet all these regulations and, of course, incur the costs of doing so. Well, cryptocurrencies, if they want to exist within the financial services world, then they will need to structure or restructure themselves in ways that will enable them to meet certain rules that are very similar to the rules that operate within the traditional financial services sector. And so long as they do that, then, um, then um, we've got no problem. And if they don't, then they are not going to be allowed to exist or coexist or interact with the financial services world, the regulated financial services world. Let's talk a bit about one of those things, which I thought was sort of the most striking, um, which was their idea that, you know, one problem is these decentralized currencies, sort of like criminals can issue them, anyone can issue them, and there's no control of the code, no control of the integrity, etc. So they said like, well, what we need is every um, or virtual currency, how they call it, needs to have a scheme, a governing, a governance authority, authority yeah. which essentially is like a legal entity incorporated yes. somewhere so it can be sued and it can be regulated by the EBA. So they will do things like, 
I, I mean, it's it's rather absurd because they say they will even check like the you know that there are no issues with this you know the code and the system and no flaws and bugs. So I'm I'm I think this may on the positive side it may be in uh it may address some of the issues we have with a lack of funding for uh, core development if the EBA is gonna take over the bug fixing. So, uh, <laughs> oh no, the EBA won't be responsible for bug fixing. <laughs> no, this was, of course, uh, slightly sarcastic. Uh, <laughs> yes, but what they're saying is that that that. Um, well, I, the, the best analogy I can give is this: um, if you take Bitcoin, some entity will have to take charge. Let's put it that way: of Bitcoin. So, if we're looking at existing entities, it might be the Bitcoin Foundation, for example. And the Bitcoin Foundation will have to have um, a part of itself that is incorporated or becomes a legal entity within the European Union and applies to whatever the regulatory authority will be for virtual currencies, if that happens. And uh, say, so we, we, we have taken control of the key elements of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so we control the integrity of Bitcoin and its um, most important components, things like the protocol and the transaction ledger. So although these things might be decentralized in the way they function, uh, they have to be controlled in some way or, or their use is controlled in some way. So, so you know, nobody can come along and just change the rules. But that's, that's by definition... That's by definition impossible. No, the whole point of a decentralized currency is that this kind of thing is not possible. So when they demand that for Bitcoin, that doesn't make any sense because the Bitcoin Foundation doesn't have this type of authority, and it will never have this type of authority. So the only the only way, I guess, is if somebody comes and they do like Eurocoin or something, and you know you start off with having a centralized thing. I mean, okay, but then it's just a centralized currency. There's not nothing really novel about that. Well, it may not be centralized in all its aspects, but there needs to be this authority that in respect of each currency, each virtual currency, that is accountable for the integrity of that currency. But you can't hold someone accountable if they can't enforce things on, you know, I mean, if they can't tell miners which version of Bitcoin and what kind of uh, version of the software to run, uh, then you know you can't hold the Bitcoin Foundation accountable, even if they're incorporated in you, etc., and say, "Hey, we stand up for this," because well, they, they can't necessarily. They can they, you can tell them something to do, but if they can't make the miners do it, if they can make the network do it, well, this is completely irrelevant. Well, um, they don't say they have the answers. In fact, the way that they refer to it is um, in coming up with the shorter and medium-term measures is to say, well, this is to give a breathing space uh, for um, new innovations in, and, and development of virtual currencies, some of which will be to um, re-engineer themselves or to engineer themselves in ways that uh, will enable them to comply with this kind of um, regulated world. I think in, term, in the Bitcoin world, this is totally impossible. There's no way to do this with Bitcoin. Uh, there really isn't. I am... The, the whole point of Bitcoin is that this is not possible. <laughs> it is... You're right. You're, you're in the world as it is now, in the virtual currency world as it is now, it, it, it does not compute. Um, so, so you're going to have two kinds. You're going to have a two. Uh, in fact, I wrote about uh, wrote a blog item on this uh, a week ago. Uh, there will be a if if this comes to pass, there'll be a two tier system. There will be virtual currencies that are regulated and that have engineered or re-engineered themselves so in no ways users. that enable them to be. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, you were saying the, the big banks and uh, other financial institutions um, are still interested in using blockchain technology. Then they have to comply with all kinds of crap and it will be, uh, you know, it will be, it will be terrible. I mean, no, nobody's going to use that. I, I don't think this is, I mean, okay, maybe it's going to make it like, marginally better than existing banking infrastructure if they use the blockchain technology i don't know maybe maybe not if if they have to build in all kinds of safeguards for the eba and and other regulators then i can very well imagine that it's not going to be any better uh but quite regardless it's not going to be the same at all and uh, of course there's no way to force users to go there 
So Absolutely. I'm curious, like, what do you like? What do you think? So, given that this is essentially, let's just say, for maybe there's a way to do other cryptocurrencies that comply with this. If you start from scratch, mm-hmm. but with Bitcoin, this is impossible. So, what do you think? Um, do you think they know that, or are they are they stupid? No, no, no. I think um, I, I, I've seen various um, articles in the last week um, saying the EBA hasn't got an idea or uh, don't understand. Um, virtual currencies and um, they completely misconstrue it from their perspective they understand it very well um, this is what I was saying earlier on it depends on your you know where you're looking at the problem from if you're a risk manager which is what the EBA is there it was there to protect the integrity of the financial system stability and and so forth the financial system in Europe um, you uh, you, you know you look at the risks which is what they do and um, you 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 uh, come up with some measures to deal with those risks they understand those uh, very well they don't care whether um, whether bitcoin um, uh, fits or doesn't fit it doesn't matter to them whether it fits or doesn't fit what it says is if bitcoin is to be part of the financial uh, the regulated financial sector then uh, it will need to fit if that's what the legislators choose of course there's a a huge gap between between the EBA's opinion and the European legislators um, enacting something that will look like this. And maybe it never will. Maybe it'll be something quite watered down. Maybe it will take into account all the the, the reality of, of of how virtual currencies are at the moment. But uh, um, you know, if you want to be part of the system in the way that the EBA sees it, if you want to be part of the system, then you need to comply with all this stuff. And it's quite interesting to show how well they understand it. They say um, they talk about the, the the risks versus the benefits of cryptocurrencies. I mean, if, if, if I could just jump in here, um, my my idea on this is that they do understand, like you say, you know, they, they do understand uh, cryptocurrencies very well, but, you know, they're not there to protect the integrity of the conceptual kind of ideological uh, things that we're trying to do with this. Absolutely. Now, um, I just kind of want to play devil's advocate on this. So, uh, on you know, this opinion, which... Uh, well, most people seem to think is negative, but in fact, I mean, at the conference when we were talking to people about it, for instance, they, I don't think they seem to really grasp the the power that the EBA had on um, national banks. And on, above and beyond that, some people seem to think that it was positive news because you know now Bitcoin can be regulated. Now we have you know potential frameworks for regulating Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that diff- there is really a, a huge difference here between the short term and the long term, right? Right. So I think the long term is you know that's just a uh, we will see what happens with that. But they, you know, if those people would be sort of in task of uh, coming up with a regulatory framework, and if they did it according to what they write in this paper, it would first of all uh, be a total disaster. It wouldn't work. Uh, but of course, that's going to take years anyway until anything comes of that. So in the meantime, we have this short-term thing, and in the short term, there's really not too much negative. In the short term, it's uh, I think it's perhaps very positive what came out of this. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. The short-term implications are are good because they provide certainty in the short term. Actually, it keeps banks um, regulated. Uh, payment institutions um, uh, out of um, direct involvement with the virtual currency world. Do you think that's a good thing? Um, potentially, yes, because um, they won't want to miss out altogether. So what they'll do is they'll form partnerships. And you've got some good examples of that already happened in uh, in your two jurisdictions, actually. In Germany, uh, Fedor Bank in Munich is a challenger bank which has um, uh, a tie up already because that is a regulated um, country by the way as far as uh, exchanges are concerned and they've done a tie up with uh, bitcoin.de and in France um, I think it's Paymium did a, 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 a tie up there with 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 uh, with a um, uh, with a with a with a, which is a payment institution, did a tie-up with a, a, a Bitcoin exchange in France. I think it's called Liquid Bank, uh, the bank they would deal with, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Just very briefly on that, so that's actually one thing I've been wondering about as well. Like, What does this mean for uh, what uh, Fido Bank is on with Bitcoin DE? Are they allowed to keep doing that? Is, is that something 
that is more on the side like, hey, uh, no, you're getting involved here? Uh, what do you think? Um, yes, and indeed, the EBA opinion uh, uh, gives tacit approval. It, 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 in fact, more than that, it's Does it, very really? specific. Oh, yes. Um, if, if you just look at, uh, at, at what they say about that, um, uh, they say the immediate response, which is what they call these short-term measures, would also still allow financial institutions to maintain, for example, a current account relationship with businesses active in the field of virtual currencies. But the uh, Fido Bank does a lot more for Bitcoin D and for uh, Kraken, I think, than just uh, maintain a current account. I mean, uh, Bitcoin DE, what they're doing is providing a financial service, right? So they, they are engaging in financial service. They don't have to necessarily license this themselves, so they get them through Fido Bank. Now, I wonder, does that fall under the sort of, well, you're allowed to provide a bank account, but not doing more? Or is, is that more on the side that, like, well, that's too much involvement? Um, well, I think you have to look at each on a case-by-case -case basis to see where where the lines are drawn between the bank and the um, Bitcoin exchange or Bitcoin business that's, that's, that's um, associated with it. It will make those lines clearer. The bank cannot hold, uh, sorry, cannot buy, hold, or sell uh, cryptocurrencies. So that's very clear uh, under this proposal in the short term. So banks can have no direct involvement in holding uh, virtual currencies. But it, um, it, it doesn't mean that it can't have a, uh, an arrangement, an exclusive arrangement or something similar with um, a, a separate um, virtual currency business. Um, they, they can agree to work you know, um, exclusively uh, with each other in a way that together forms a single business business functioning as a single business you know providing the the, the payment um, uh, interface into the clearing systems for example um, but the bitcoin business would be sitting right outside the bank it would be outside the regulated sector okay so uh, i mean i guess that's if you know if that's the case in the short term then um, you know i really I mean, you know i especially you right you're in the us uh, in the uk and i think in the uk right bitcoin businesses have had huge difficulties getting bank accounts so maybe maybe that's going to. Do you think that's going to become easier now? Hmm. Now that's a that's a very good question. I, I I'm not um, yet sure that uh, this alone will 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 um, make a difference. But I think it's it, it, this, the clarity that this gives if it comes to pass. Remember, uh, again, this is a recommendation to national authorities, national supervisors to 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 give effect to this. Um, but. Um, in the long term, or sorry, in the the, the uh, medium term, short to medium term, I think um, it will be helpful uh, for for UK businesses to to get bank accounts because the banks understand um, um, where that separation is, and for them to um, have exposure to virtual currencies, they'll need to to, to handle accounts uh, for businesses that um, that are in that sector. So what also seems to be the case, right? So here in Germany, they did at one point say this is uh, like uh, some private money and uh, so essentially like some things would be financial services. Uh, and now it seems, you know, the, the intersection between fiat and Bitcoin is going to, uh, you know, remain very regulated even in the short term. But it seems to me that in the next two, three years, perhaps does this mean you can kind of do whatever you want? as long as you're not touching a fiat currency? Uh, broadly speaking, yes, unless, unless individual countries in Europe have a more um, regulated um, regime. So in Germany and France, um, you both are subject to um, more regulated regimes in that um, cryptocurrency exchanges are subject to regulation in, in both jurisdictions, for example, right now because your national regulators have said so. Um, but the rest of Europe, um, where there aren't such specific uh, or aren't necessarily such specific um, regular, regulatory requirements, um, they can essentially um, continue with impunity, um, except that the, the, the other recommendation, which is that exchanges should operate and become part of the anti-money laundering legislation in those countries and uh, i think that was pretty much expected anyway and um it's probably a you know uh, probably a good thing because it will help the reputation of, uh, of virtual currencies so 
if you compare the let's say the um, uh, competitiveness of Europe versus the US as a sort of a place to start a cryptocurrency Bitcoin business, do you think this makes a difference? Do you think uh, what do you think is the better place now? And oh, and perhaps over the next uh, m- maybe the next three years, and I guess longer term is extremely hard to tell at this point. I think it's hard to tell, but but, but 2014 is certainly the year where 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 the landscape is uh, is changing almost uh, uh, week by week, day by day, because you get an announcement like this, and you say, well, if all this comes to pass, then Europe becomes an extremely uncompetitive place for. Um, for cryptocurrencies, but maybe a great place in the next two or three years. No, but in the short term, a, a, a fabulous place. So, um, I th- uh, certainly some parts of uh, the European Union, Willie. You know, if 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 you say, well, right now you, you've got to be regulated in Germany, you've got to be regulated in in France, and one to other places, uh, but you don't have to be regulated in. UK, uh, UK could be a wonderful short-term place to um, um, to, to to start a business. The problem, uh, the elephant in the room, is the long-term problem, because if this thing which the EBA envisages comes to pass, everywhere throughout Europe will then be the same, and will be part of somewhere that's extremely. Um, uncompetitive so what do you do you've got uh, a world at the moment where an exchange can exist uh, say in the uk doesn't have to be regulated um, maybe it has to be regulated for anti-money laundering quite soon that, uh, that, that let's say that's that's a given pretty much everywhere over the next year or two i should imagine um, but apart from that which is which is not such a big deal um, it doesn't have to meet capital requirements. It doesn't have reporting requirements. It um, it doesn't have to pass all sorts of tests as to the way the business is run in terms of governance, in terms of the people who run it, and so on. So uh, everything else is, say, pretty lightweight. So wonderful place to do business. You you build up a successful business. What happens in three or four years' time if there's, say, a virtual currency directive that then has to be implemented throughout the European Union? Uh, do you then deregulate as a... As a, as, a, as a regulated business, you, you, well, you wouldn't be regulated, but do you stay in the deregulated sector and now stop dealing with any currencies that might choose to become regulated? Um, your ability after this long-term set of objectives will be that um, – um, you, you'll have to work outside the system. Um, you know, if you if you carry out certain functions, um, such as exchange functions, uh, you know, if they're for deregulated um, deregulated uh, currencies, well, you're sort of outside the system. But then, will banks still want to run a bank account for you? Mm, that 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 becomes questionable. Perhaps we can talk about some of these places in Europe that aren't uh, subject to this uh, European Banking Authority opinion and, and subsequent European uh, regulation. Um, so the Isle of Man is one of those places where they've uh, pretty much like opened up the red carpet for Bitcoin businesses to come in, uh, stating that they won't be regulated and that they'll only be subject to anti-money laundering uh, laws. Um, what's what's the long-term potential for places like this to uh, become sort of, you know, the center, you know, for for all Bitcoin exchanges to uh, set up uh, in the European. Uh... They're they're, que- they're queuing up right now to to start up in places like the Isle of Man. Um, they announced a few weeks ago that, uh, as you say, the doors are open. If you run a reputable uh, virtual currency exchange, please come to the Isle of Man. Um, all you need to do is register the fact that you're. Uh, dealing in virtual currencies um, and that uh, you comply with our anti-money laundering laws and um, uh, uh, and for the time being we have no plans to to regulate so uh, what a wonderful um, incubation environment um, Isle of Man will be a number of exchanges have already set up um, there there's an incubator um, open for Opened its doors already. There, um, a lot of very, um, um, a lot of people queuing up to start up in the Isle of Man, and there will be other locations. So, um, the Channel Islands, um, Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, um, the, 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 these locations will be looking to to do things. Uh, they already are looking. 
Um, other offshore centers such as uh, Gibraltar, uh, which is uh, you know physically in Europe but 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 outside the European Union, uh, same as the Channel Islands and um, and the Isle of Man, um, all 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 waiting to, uh, to 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 welcome business. Isn't that a risk though? That all I mean, if we if we get to a situation where uh, most, if not all, of Bitcoin exchanges are situated in, is in these jurisdictions, that uh, a shift in uh, in regulation or a shift in policy for those for those uh, jurisdictions uh, down the line can just basically effectively run all of those uh, exchanges, uh, you know, um, illegal or unregulated or is, isn't that a risk? I mean, I think as an, ex- as an exchange, you won't be able to do that anyway because you're going to have to interact, intersect with the, you know, if you want to do a euro Bitcoin exchange, you know, you're not going to be able to avoid the regulations if you want to ha- allow people to use a bank transfer, SEPA, etc. Right? That's right, because you have to be within with the SEPA to uh, be able to accept euros. But I guess it's interesting if you're a pure Bitcoin business and you don't really care about interacting with the existing financial system, then perhaps that's a great place. Well, uh, think about how it is now. Um, you've got um, exchanges all over the world. You've, you've got exchanges in, in, in China, for example. Until a couple of months ago, you could quite happily do business with them. Um, you've got exchanges in Singapore. You've got exchanges in Hong Kong. Uh, you've got exchanges in South Africa. Uh, you, you can you can send payments there and um, deal with exchanges there just as uh, as you can within the European Union. So that's really not a problem. In the USA, they they tend to extend their regulation beyond their shores. So they say that if you do business f- from outside the USA, but with somebody who's resident in the USA who, or who is a US citizen, then our US rules apply. In Europe, it tends not to be that way. In Europe, it tends to be the case that if you do business uh, in Europe, um, it's where you do the business that, 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 that counts, not who you do business with. So um, you could be in Europe and um, deal with an exchange outside of Europe um, relatively easily. But you, you're right to highlight the problem with the banking sector, because even in places like the Isle of Man, the Isle of Man is a part of, although it's not part of the UK, it plugs into the UK uh, payment clearing system, bank clearing system, and as such um, is reliant on the main banks who operate that clearing system. So even the banks in the Isle of Man who are rubbing their hands together at the prospect of lots of new business coming their way, um, they still have to bring their clearing partners along with them uh, to to accept this business and uh, in ways that uh, will not upset them and affect their other business. And what about the interaction with uh, the Eurozone banking system and SEPA transfers? Like how, how does that work? Well, the... Um the European system, the actual clearing system, is is uh, Target, and um, uh, it, it operates in a slightly different way, and it's applied slightly differently in different um, in different um, countries. Um, but it's easier f- um, for, for in, in some respects, for payment institutions to 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 deal with that clearing system than it is in the UK. But nevertheless. It's administered generally by in each country by a, a central clearing authority, usually the national bank in that country, and of course they will only open accounts with other uh, for for payment institutions. So uh, you have to be part of the regulated sector to to plug into uh, to plug into the clearing system. So yeah, banking will be the uh, will be the problem area, and if we come back to the longer term issue. Um, there'll be the included regulated world and the excluded world. The excluded world will not be able to do anything with the fiat world because at every point of interface, banks, for example, payment institutions, it will not be allowed to interact almost certainly. So be out in the cold. Okay, but um, I don't see that as, you know, like if I was running, let's say, some crypto business uh, that's, you know, there are all those things like exchanges where obviously you intersect. But, you know, once people have Bitcoins, and then if then you say, like, 
some business that I don't know is a gambling site that just uses Bitcoin or any any kind of business that's purely Bitcoin, then if someone tells me, well, you know, you're not allowed to intercept interact with the banking system, you know, because um, this is not regulated in the right way, uh, but you can do whatever you want because you know this is not regulated, then I, I think this is not such a not such a terrible thing. Or, or does that mean some things will become illegal, some activities? Well, I don't think we, we, there's no detail. So we don't know what will or won't be illegal or even if any of this will come to pass. Um, but, but for virtual currencies to succeed, they need to have points of interface with the real world. You've got to be able to, to, to buy and sell your, your, your virtual currencies um, and exchange them rather for, for, for fiat currencies. And, um, there's always going to be a, a, a there's going to have to be a gateway um those gateways w- will will effectively be uh, be choke points okay so i i mean i guess we can sort of uh, summarize this you know i mean i i was when i read it first i was sort of worried i mean i, I did see in the short term it's okay i think i'm in i think in a sense this is a, a good thing you know because bitcoin will develop so much before these people like get any kind of coherent plan together that it will probably be outdated by the time they have a plan so they will have to start over um so you know i think this could be you know it could after all be a positive thing and just the fact that the the, also that the report gives two or three years you know to work without really having regulation uh you know like you say it it might give some time for the bitcoin ecosystem to uh, evolve uh without regulation and perhaps at the end of that you know uh, their opinions will have changed you know what, what do you guys think about that yeah i think that's very likely I don't think the EBA's opinion will change at all. I think um, that they've done a very clever thing by issuing this as an opinion. They've said, here, we told you all the bad news. Um, They've discounted a lot of the benefits. And they say that those benefits anyway are less important within the European Union. And they're not really concerned about anything outside. Um, If these things come to pass they'll even be those benefits will 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 evaporate even more because the costs will increase yeah but we're talking about really like low level benefits but we're not talking about some of the the new innovations that are coming out of uh the you know the cryptocurrency space right so, i mean they're only addressing it as a currency and they're not they're addressing some of this other stuff like crowdfunding and stuff you know so i think that they're missing the ball on that and uh, to only address the underlying benefits of bitcoin as a currency which you know we all agree on and such oh but that's complicated enough already i mean yeah I, i'm sure i mean sebastian i'm sure you're right right that that whole crowdfunding thing is going to come up as well you know that's going to come up later uh, i'm probably not going to take that long let's say maybe in a year or so in the next year i presume we will see statements there as well but um i sean uh, sean i i think i'm i'm you know i'm going to disagree with you here because i think in two years so much can happen like let's say in the US we've had something like you know 200 million dollars invested in Bitcoin startups. Now let's say in two years we have that same equivalent amount invested in Europe. Let's say we have you know we go from three million users to 50 million users. We'll have lots of businesses starting accepted, like a, more of an understanding. I mean, it, these things will have I think will have a big effect on. Uh, I think that's and in the end, my whole view of this kind of is. The most important thing uh, for Bitcoin and for cryptocurrencies is growth. Because if it grows fast and it, all these services are developed, a lot of users are added, it would be much, much harder uh, to have uh, regulations and rules that you know, cripple Bitcoin. Because they will hurt a lot of people. They will, uh, you know, they will destroy jobs, etc. So if it gives us two years, three years, that's uh, huge. I mean, let's think back three years. Where was Bitcoin three years ago? Exactly. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, the faster Bitcoin and virtual currencies generally grow, uh, the more important uh, the sector becomes, um, the more uh, important politically um, uh, not stifling uh, with uh, not over-regulating um, We'll, 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 we'll be on the agenda. But um, think about the European legislative process. Uh, the day that this opinion was published, uh, 
the European Commission, the, the commissioner responsible for the financial services sector, said, fine, we're on the case. Um, his, uh, um, his office issued a, a, a response to one of the newspapers, uh, one of the news organizations, I think it was Bloomberg, said, yes, we, 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 this is obviously really urgent. We're going to have to start on this straight away. Now, admittedly, the, the focus there was on, um, on anti-money laundering as the most urgent thing, but, yep, we're going to start work on this thing. So it will take um, probably um, a year or so, um, maybe two, for a draft virtual currencies directive to come out, if that's the route that they choose. And that then will be subject to... Uh, negotiation and revision over probably another one year period where all the different uh, countries will have their input and the politicians will start to have their say and eventually a final draft will come out in maybe two three years time that will go before the european parliament and these are all politicians voted direct uh, you know elected directly by um, their constituents in europe by people like the three of us and uh, these politicians will then say yay, nay, or change some of the some of what has been proposed. It'll then go to the Council of Ministers, which are basically the the governments of the twenty eight member states sitting together as a kind of committee, as a council. And eventually, if they endorse it, it becomes law. So this thing that is down the line, maybe three or four years, it will start now. It will start in these next few months. So unfortunately. Um, we need to mobilize uh, politically and locally within our different countries to get our viewpoints about um, about virtual currencies across and the, the value, the economic value, the benefits and so on uh, uh, may, uh, may need to be weighed more greatly in this balance that goes on so that the end product is not something that's over-regulated or perhaps not even regulated at all. Yeah, but some of, the, some of these values and viewpoints are, in fact, uh, challenging the current system and the current model in place, notably the political system and you know the democracy itself. So, uh, I mean, if, you're, if we're looking at like broader stuff, you know, for instance, um, how, how do you think that will sit with, uh, with politicians to say that, you know, we want uh, cryptocurrencies to replace democracy down you know, long term? Ooh. <laughs> Wow, that, you mean as in um, as in decentralized voting systems, for example? Yeah, for instance, yeah. that's uh, that's that's an interesting uh, thought, isn't it? You know, if 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 I think that our legislators across Europe will probably have um, will struggle to understand some of the concepts behind cryptocurrencies. They'll re- you know they they'll probably look more closely to. Um, the existing fiat world and so will relate very heavily to some of these points that are raised by the EBA. They may kind of then get the idea of virtual currencies a bit more because if there's enough if enough people like the three of us and the, the huge community that there is in Europe that, can, that gets across to our national legislators and to our national European legislators that represent us get these things across uh, then um, they'll understand the some of these more um, uh, ideological concepts behind uh, behind but will they see that you know this might threaten the whole system of uh, of, of of government oh I, I think they might struggle with that one yeah i mean i think this is obviously just the first wave of these things because uh you know sebastian as you correctly pointed out this only concerns bitcoin as sort of money and of course there's all these other things that uh, you know they haven't dealt with and you know well, they're, that not, will... they're not interested the eba has no interest in any other uses and and in, indeed in a in in their world well they are about the financial system though i mean if you talk about uh, when you start having derivatives or shares and all that kind of stuff you know i mean well derivatives are an interesting one that's a different that's a different um, uh, bureaucracy that's the european securities and markets authority and okay, they yeah. may they may also have something to say about it but actually that's that's not not so difficult to understand because derivatives that are based on Bitcoin um, are just derivatives. What they're based on doesn't really matter. 
Um, but if you've got derivatives as are proposed in 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 um, uh, some some of the Ethereum uh, projects, for example, that are being talked about, um, these these are more interesting because they the the the, the, the you know the the, the derivative it's itself then um, maybe a decentralized agent and uh, therefore not subject to market control and i wouldn't be surprised if they then come up with something similar to the eba solution you know you uh, for it to be legal it needs to have a governing authority because if it's decentralized then obviously there's not an issuer but if there's not an issuer there needs to someone needs to be accountable i mean perhaps my, my thoughts on this and you know, uh, the 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 fact that this is going to take so long, you know, the fact that this regulation is going to take two, three, maybe four years to to be put in place and enacted at the European level, and you know, by this time, Bitcoin will have evolved uh, tenfold, perhaps. Uh, we'll just show, we'll just go to show and illustrate and demonstrate the the archaic nature of our governments and and illustrate that in fact you know, this new technology can uh change the way that we do things and and uh make our society move forward so i, I think that the very fact that bitcoin will be regulated and it, that it will take so long uh will be a very good uh well a very good boost for uh for this new technology i think we need to be mobilized um quickly to have some real political uh, or exercise some political force uh, to mitigate um, some of these proposals as early as possible. European legislation in the payments sector has um, um, followed after the event so often. If we look back at the Payment Services Directive um, in the early noughties, the e-money directive, they were being revised, you know, quite frequently before they settled down, uh, because they were, you know, it took so long for each of them to 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 be drafted and pass into law that they were then out of out of date already by the time they became law. Similar sort of thing will happen here probably if there's a uh, if there's the will to come up with some kind of virtual currencies directive in Europe, then uh, you know work will start on that now. It might pop out of the system in um, in three four years time two three four years time uh, is that going to be transparent at all this process like what's going on or no clue oh yes it, it will yes be. The, oh yes i uh, these things were you know the, the the european legislative process is transparent this opinion and what went into it was completely without transparency the eba can take uh, measures to uh, to have hearings or, or, or hold um, hearings and, and so but but the eba didn't do that for this opinion it came up with its opinion and said here legislators you go and do something with it and the next step the european commission is always consulting with everybody uh, that's why it takes so long. Uh, so yes, that's why I say we need to 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 mobilize and uh, get a voice at uh, at the table now. Because if we don't, laws will be uh, enacted based on what the bankers say. This is the European Banking Authority. It's responsible for the old world, the traditional world, and they're about to say what should happen in the virtual currency world by saying it should become part of it. Okay. Um, now we we need to have a voice in the virtual currency world that says well actually there may be some good reasons not to some of the things are good um you know things like um um uh, having um having um uh, for example anti-money laundering is generally considered to be a a, a good thing. Um, some of these things will be unworkable, like the scheme governing authorities. It will kill off um, virtual currencies as they currently exist if that was to happen. So this two-tier system probably isn't going to function very well. There needs to be something else. Um, so, you know, we need to get this the, 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 this heard, this voice heard. Yeah, so it's important, I guess, for all of us, you know, that we are active in different countries with different foundations, etc., you know, get involved in that and uh, and try to steer this process. But I guess, especially if it is transparent, uh, then I think that's quite optimistic. So uh, maybe before, um, before we wrap up, because we're kind of at the end of our show, uh, Sean, uh, you wanted to give a very brief update uh, about uh, what you've been up to uh, with your company, no? 
Oh, yes, thank you. Um, well, we're opening offices um, uh, over the next few months in, well, surprise, surprise, the Isle of Man, um, sp- specialising there on uh, regulatory compliance matters. We're going to be opening up in Brussels, uh, specifically with uh, public affairs. Um, so we'll be talking a lot to the European Commission. I guess that office will 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 be very busy over the next um, next um, few few months and years so are you going to get paid by companies to do this public affairs work or how how does that work because it seems to be sort of in the interest of bitcoin versus uh or or is that like a company will hire you uh to do some lobbying for them well um speaking personally i i I, I'm, i'm already active with um the uk digital currency association and through that with 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 tie-ups with other european uh, organizations and the work that we do there of course will be um you know will be for the general good uh, there's nobody paying us for that but um um, the, the idea of opening an office is that there will be businesses that will want to have their voice heard uh, there are already substantial businesses um, existing in the space and they will be affected by this by these proposals and will want to have their voices heard and we'll also you know that there are also other investors uh, vcs not virtual currencies but um, venture capital companies that uh, um, have earmarked this space and want to uh, perhaps um, have a voice that's heard as well so um yeah there we there be companies that will 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 want to have that uh, that public affairs representation okay fantastic so if somebody is uh, you know is working on that or is thinking of setting up uh a virtual currency or a cryptocurrency company, then you know, please get in touch with Sean, and uh, you know, perhaps he can uh, help you do that you know, on the Isle of Man or, or some place like that that's uh, friendly and where you don't get harassed too much. <laughs> I guess the good thing for you is that all this regulatory news is just bringing in more business. <laughs> well, it's my field, so that's that, exactly. that's good. But I just find it extremely challenging, and uh, you know, interesting and challenging. Yeah, so thanks so much, uh, you know, for listening this week. Uh, and uh, thanks, Sean, for joining us today and kind of giving Thank us... Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, giving us the update on uh, on the EBA, what's kind of going on uh, with regulation. I think this is, has given us a reasonably good idea of what the situation is in Europe in the next two years, three years. I think at least uh, some rough uh, idea, and, and I think that's a useful thing. So, yeah, thanks so much for listening. Um, if you want to support the show, you can, you know, you can support us by tipping or donating at Epicenter Bitcoin slash tips. You can also follow us on Twitter at Epicenter BTC. And uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter, which goes out every Friday. Well, except last Friday because there was a coin summit, but next Friday will. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's it. We'll be back next week. Actually, uh, in during the week next week, uh, Sean's second regulation episode is out. And then we'll be back with a regular episode. Uh, a week from now. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm.